I figured out the flow state because if you think about it, a dive takes less than three seconds. In that three seconds is total chaos. It's a free fall. And in that three seconds is your creation. You're never going to create what you just did ever again. So you got to let it go. Hello, Golden Ones. It is my honor to welcome on this episode of Drops of Gold, a true golden soul. Multiple Olympic gold medal winner, Greg Luganis. Now, Greg is somebody who has more records in terms of obliterating anything that existed before and may stand the test of time as it relates to Olympic gold medals in diving. This is somebody who has overcome adversity, who has shown us what it looks like to have resilience and resonance and who's relentless in his pursuit for living. This is somebody who, after his gold medals, has really just begun his life and continues to go on his own expansive healing and revealing journey. Enjoy this episode with Greg Luganis, truly a man living in drops of gold. I'm Jeff Skultz. I have been on the healing and revealing journey, following my thread to my inner gold. My great honor in life is to sit with the golden ones and discover what they've released in terms of their past stuck stories, what they've revealed in terms of who they are anew, and within that, how we can each celebrate the art of living life golden. Welcome to Drops of Gold. Hey there, Golden Ones. This episode of Drops of Gold is powered by One Golden Thread, the regenerative nature fashion brand that I created from my mind's eye that we can all live in regenerosity. Enjoy the program, and we've got a special code for you later on to share. You are golden. We are all connected, better together, as one golden thread. Welcome to another episode of Drops of Gold. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here with my dear friend and a true beacon of light, Greg Luganis. Thank you. You know, there's so many different gateways and portals from which we can begin. Okay. The way that I always start my podcast yes. is breathing exercise. Take me in. So inhale for four, exhale for eight. Expel all the air out of your lungs. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax. Just to just drop into your body. And that's where we start. Mm. We have arrived. We've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> we've graduated. We've arrived. <laughs> we are here. You know, it, um, it's going to be fascinating to talk about... Um, this notion of being embodied in our body and how do we ground ourselves before we take a precise and decisive action, which we'll talk about the swing thought of being on the metaphorical board yeah. and, and what have you. But, you know, one of the, the beautiful conversations we were having in the kitchen before we, before we dropped in was um, an extraordinary moment that we had on Drops of Gold. Mm-hmm with 
Sanyika, the fire starter street. And with the breath work and with this, uh, it's a beautiful invocation. So we were excited to share with you and what a beautiful way to do it is to give you the gift of receiving no, uh, Thank you. this beautiful blessing. What you haven't heard, Jeff, is you haven't heard the, you need to be you, the real you, the brilliant, dynamic, unapologetic you. The screw what everybody thinks, the most energetic you, or the one who cares too much, damn it, the most empathetic you. And to all those that doubted you, tell them, make them a promise to be like the incredible you and smash the negative comments. Don't you get it? The real you is what the world needs more. And once you get it, you'll realize that the world is yours. Ain't no stopping you. Keep it moving. Become the better you. Never be a replacement. There'll be no one instead of you. When they think of your greatness, there'll be no one ahead of you. They'll be loving the alphabet. They'll say, I never met a you. Uh, that's the golden approach. That's the, the bull move. Wow. That's beautiful. That's stunning. What that brings up, the reason why it brings up some emotion in me is like what we were talking about. You know, it's like we dim our lights for the comfort of others so that other people are more comfortable around us and so what we do is we dim our lights and don't embrace who who we truly are right you know it's it's interesting because yeah you know, I've, I've achieved a lot of things you know i've got a whole bunch of records and like what you know what i was saying to you victory is like uh, you know, a lot of that I'm realizing, you know, those records have stood for years. But I'm also recognizing that a lot of those performances, they, that wasn't me. It was something beyond me. I was used as a tool, you know, to, of expression. And also, I mean, diving, when, when I was younger, I didn't speak. It's so funny because I'm writing a script, a uh, bio series uh, about my life uh, because I don't feel I can tell my story in two hours. Hmm. So I'm writing it into a series and the, <laughs> the first episode, because we're going chronologically, and it's like, oh my God, you know, my, my, the, the writer that I'm working with, David Toussaint, he said, okay, we're in it like 37 pages and you haven't said a word. <laughs> I said, that's right. You know, because that's what was happening a lot with my life is people were speaking for me. Even in writing Breaking the Surface, you know, people made assumptions and gave me dialogue. I didn't have words when I was growing up. Because like what, you know, what we were talking about is I had an older sister. We were both adopted. And I never, you know, formulated sentences. I didn't know I stuttered until I started school. But she would tell me how I felt. You know, so, Greg, what do you... Oh, he wants X, Y, Z. Oh, Greg feels X, Y, Z. It was much more easy for me just to agree you know, there was no friction. So then Greg didn't know who Greg was. What did that feel like in your body when you were being told how you felt? Was it was it a, a submission where, or was it a feeling of a loneliness? Or what was that feeling that you were feeling as others were finishing your sentences? It was different things at different times. So sometimes it was, oh yeah, they got it. Oh, they get me. But other times it was like, oh, there's a little discomfort. It's like, well, n no, but you know, taking the path of least resistance mm -hmm. said, well, okay, I'll just agree. But then the more I did that in sub submission, 
I was dimming my own light. I was, I was learning that in order to maneuver in this world, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta dim your light. You know, you gotta, you can't be who you are. Because you know, otherwise you're going to get beat up, you're going to be, you know, get chastised, you're going to be criticized. And it's, it's not that. So we, we, we don't embrace um, difference, you know, diversity. We say we do, you know, on the outside, but truly... To our core, I think we're getting there. We're getting to that place now, you know, where we're seeing the light in other people, mm. rather than looking. Um, you know, what we're talking about, you know, stepping into the being of yeah. who we are, yeah. instead of just being the observer of what we do. You know, it, it's it's a it's a slippery slope when we recognize the light in others while dismissing our own. Right. Because and I know that feeling very well. I one of my superpowers or my true superpower that I discovered when I was about eight years old was I got to see the light that in that resided inside others. Mm-hmm. And I would, even as a child, I would take the moment to shine the spotlight on them mm-hmm. and maybe ask them a follow-up question from a question that, that illuminates their light even further in their own right. mind to allow them maybe to see something in themselves. And I developed that muscle memory. That was my muscle memory. But I was empathetic to everyone's journey but my own. Right. And the And the slippery slope is when we are dimming our own light as you... It was like an anvil in my soul when you when you encapsulated it. Dim your own light for the comfort of others, mm-hmm. and and the the notion that that you know it's really us being out of integrity with our own light if we are simply shining the light on others and dimming our own, and yeah, you know, we all have a crucible moment. Um, where did your crucible moment begin? Where you realized even if you were if you were pushing past and, 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 and feeling like it was a it was a it was that light wolf and dark wolf battle inside yourself obviously there was moments where you where you shattered it because you could not have achieved the the excellence that along your path and so i know it's a continuing process and right. in this chapter of your life it's a renewed about this notion of dimming your light um, and or shining or shining your light. Mm-hmm. Where was the first time that you gave yourself permission to shine? I think it was, uh, I mean, it, and it, it wasn't a time. Mm-hmm. It was more a space. So at the pool, yeah. I, I wasn't dimming that light. At home, abusive relationship, managers that you know took everything from me. I mean, it was I was caught up with the polarity yeah. of the light and the dark, mm. and that was my life. You know, so the only thing, the only way that I can. In order to grow, we have to work on ourselves, right? So it has to come from us. It was so funny because, like, um, I was thinking, you know, now that I'm new, divorced and single, you know, it's like, okay, what do I want in a partner? And I rewrote that, scratched that out. It's like, who do I need to become? Because that is the key. We attract like. So who do I need to become? I knew how, who I needed to become in diving because I had my coach, Ron O'Brien. He was my mirror. Right. He was the one who gave me that reflection. But in my personal life, that was a mess. Total chaos. And 
I didn't even know who I was. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So we'll go, we'll go backwards because it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to, to dive into that. Yeah. There's so much richness and let's stay in the present though. Who do you get, who do you get to become in this chapter of your life? I'm learning that. And I don't think that's a single adoration. I mean, I think that it's, I mean, it's constant. I, you know, this is who I am today. Mm. Um, and you know what, uh, even, you know, when, when I say that, you know, I, I mean, I think of it like a yoga practice. You know, it's a practice. We're practicing, you know. Uh, you can have an incredible practice. I, I remember I was in Canada, it was really cold, and I did my yoga practice. And like, oh, I used to go a lot further on this pose. But because of the elements, you know, the temperature of the room, the all where, where I was, um, it affected me. So I had yeah. to honor that. It's like, wow, this is a great lesson mm. because we have to honor where we are. Mm. Because otherwise we're just fighting against ourselves. And that's the reason why I, you know, I started um, listening to uh, Michael Singer mm -hmm. and his work, The Untethered Soul. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, it's been really wonderful for me to be able to see and recognize blockages and um, allowing, allowing that and also, oh, you've got it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I know this is a, yeah. this is a special one. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it just, I mean, it is so, uh, so wonderful to uh, acknowledge that. And uh, I was talking about my friend Kyle Cease, mm -hmm. and he talks about, um, you know, just sitting with things. And that that's another thing. Recently, I stopped uh, vaping. Mm. And so letting that go. So um, it's, uh, yeah, those, those cravings and stuff like that, they yeah. churn up and all that. Yeah. But just sitting with it. Okay, what, what is this about? You know? I, I, love the, I love that you said honoring where you are. It's honoring who you are mm -hmm. in this moment. All sides of you. You know, uh, uh, a uh, incredible shaman. I had an opportunity to have moments with along my journey. I talked about to truly understand what gratitude is to be grateful, not just for the shiny bits, but every bit. Every bit. And in this moment of you saying, like, "Hey, I'm honoring myself," and and there's, and I'm gonna, and maybe even within that, the, within the honoring, um, we don't even have to. We can accept. We can love. We can forgive. Mm -hmm. We can allow ourselves to receive, allow. allow ourselves to receive with ease, as opposed to even like this courting that can sometimes happen about like, I'm, so, I'm I apologize, I'm sorry. Like yes, we 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 can do that. It's like that. There's there's something in in here, within this within this this shining our light versus dimming our light, mm -hmm. and 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 how do we um, make reconciliations with our past, present future by realizing that we can allow, we can accept, we can, and we can love and, mm. and, and love all the parts. And I mean, you're on such a beautiful journey and you've, and you've, and you discover that. And, and so I, you know, honor, I honor you for, you know, for the, for the depth of your journey. So mm. I, where I want to take this right now is someplace that is going to be an edge point for you. Okay. Um, as someone who has done things that others could only dream of, mm -hmm. as someone who's accomplished things that are, are standing the test of time and may never be repeated, um, the edge point for you is to give you this golden mic to share with like a river of self-love mm. of all the things you've accomplished in your life and for you to share it 
openly and it's not about you being a channel and for others and their experience no this this is the mo- this is the moment for you to basically for you to speak into the audacity of the awe of what you have accomplished and you could take us as far back to some of the performances as a child you could take us to you could take us to the pool you can take us wherever you choose to go but i i, I really um i'm looking forward to receiving the the audacity of the awe of what you've accomplished in your in your voice well it, it's interesting because i okay that that obviously makes me very uncomfortable because i'm not you know it's like oh don't, I, growing up, I mean, I was told by, by my mother, you know, don't outshine your sister. My sister was older than me. And so it, it was like, okay, I've, I got it. I, and I don't know where that came from. I, I, I wrote this letter to my sister in, um, I mean, I know how hard it must have been for her, yeah. you know, to be Greg Luganis's older sister. I mean, she was the old older sibling and it was you know it must have been really really difficult for her you know um but recognizing that acknowledging that Mm. um but it's also something that i've held on to so preciously for so long it's been a part of who I am. I mean, it's been that's that that skin that I wear, and it's it's no longer serving me. So I need to shed that skin. So right? maybe you know, maybe this is even a precursor because you know we all have crucible moments. Mm-hmm. You've had extraordinary and and very public crucible moments and for those who have not checked this book this uh, this breaking the surface is is uh, is is quite an extraordinary anthology of it you know um one of my crucible moments that speaks to this notion is when i shared for the first time something that was deep inside me in terms of what was meant to be expressed and i was so fearful and I felt so, and I actually shamed myself mm-hmm. because I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I'm speaking into this mic, that means I'm being egoic, narcissistic, or selfish because I'm taking a moment from another. And the second time that I shared it with an individual, he looks at me and he asked me what I'm going to do with this. Mm-hmm. And I said, nothing. And he says, no, I'm asking you a question. What are you going to do with this? And I said, nothing. And who am I to share? I'm just Jeff. These are just my raw thoughts. Mm -hmm. And in 33 words, he obliterated like like a fractalizing um, of every lie that I told myself about egoic, narcissistic, and and, and selfish when he said that we're on this planet for three reasons. To learn, to love, and to share. And if you're not sharing your gifts, you're being selfish. He poked me in the chest. He says, quit being so fucking selfish. Yeah. And in that moment, it, 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 it all just came into such beautiful focus. It was literally like a melting, yeah. a death energy in the most extraordinary way yeah. where what we are actually here to do is to share. And by sharing, we are inspiring another to lean into their gifts. Yeah because they can see a piece of themselves. And, and from that perspective, when you said that, yes, you are, you, know, you are a gift, it's not about your accomplishments. It's about, it's about, it, it's about what, it's, it's what they represent in terms of mm-hmm. the conviction, the devotion, and the accomplishments. I mean, the, the accomplished um, uh, essence of, of, um, of, of legacy and how that's inspired somebody else to step deeper into their gifts. So from that perspective, that was for me a beautiful reframing. Right. And, and, uh, and so I really do genuinely invite you into your edge. I want to hear about the, about the, the audacity of the awe and the things that you're proud of. 
because you have so much to be proud of. Okay, and speaking to that, because um, like what what triggered a thought to me is, um, and I, I'm recognizing now I've been I've been playing small. You know that, um, yeah. When I was uh, sports director of Red Bull Cliff Diving, you know, I had contact with some of the athletes, and so I was giving them a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, and you talked about sharing, uh, and I also equate that with teaching and learning because it's a two-way street. And so I've been playing small. It's uh, for whatever reason that, you know, don't outshine your sister, whatever that that was, or, you know, and all. But, um, and and also, I mean, I've always said, you don't achieve greatness on your own. So the one person that was always there for me, well, one, my mother, because if I was in a high stress situation, final dive of the 1988 Olympic Games, Shun Ni from China is leading by three points, and then I have, I, I he does his dive and he gets nine and a half, and and then I have my my dive. I had higher degree of difficulty, but it's like uh, it could go either way, and um, executing the dive. Um, and then I was successful. Who got me through that? And that was six months prior to the Olympic Games. I was diagnosed diagnosed HIV positive. Uh, had I they known my HIV status, then they wouldn't have allowed allowed me into the country of Seoul because there was a travel ban. Um, and I mean, there were so many things. But and my coach, I, they put me on AZT right away. Right. There's issues with that. I didn't realize. I mean, looking back. AZT uh, depleted testosterone. So when I was training, I was afraid to share this with my coach at the time because um, I thought he'd start taking it easy on me, but I was literally crawling from my bed to the bathroom each morning. I couldn't walk but because I, I was so sore. I would turn, turn the hottest bath, pour myself the hottest bath, slink in there, and after soaking for 20 minutes, I could finally function, I could touch my toes, I can walk. And I thought I was just overtraining. I had no idea that that potentially could have been what it was, what was going on. So it made sense, because uh, like when I started working on the book, Breaking the Surface, Eric Marcus, he said, well, you were diagnosed HIV positive six months prior to the Olympic Games in Seoul. Were you on any t- type of treatment? And I said, yeah, they wanted to treat me very aggressively, so they put me on AZT right away. And he started sobbing, sobbing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that reaction. And I said, you know, once he calmed down, I said, Eric, why did you, you know, react that way? I said, you know what, Greg, any of my friends that that went on AZT, if they tolerated it, they didn't tolerate it well. And he said, and it killed a lot of people, that treatment. And he said, you won two Olympic gold medals on AZT. He said, you'll never know what that was, what that meant. I was like, wow. So now looking back, absorbing that, understanding, having a better understanding of that, you know, and the way that this came about was uh, in speaking with uh, some of my transgender friends, you know, who transitioning from male to female, you know, and going on to hormone therapy and all that stuff, and they shared some of their experiences. Oh my God, that sounds so familiar. And then I did some more research. It's like, oh my God, I was low testosterone. And I was like, oh, that's the reason why I never should have won those medals. I never should have won them. That was, that's insane. I'm taking this toxic drug, you know, and performing in the Olympics. That's totally, totally insane. 
you know, and that's why I, you know, because I, I feel, I figured out the flow state, okay? Mm -hmm. That's easy. <laughs> that's easy for me. I figured out the flow state, um, how to get there, how to stay there, how to, you know, it, how to manipulate it. So, um, yeah, I got that figured out. I got that wired. Because if you think about it, a dive takes less than three seconds. In that three seconds is total chaos. It's a free fall. And in that three seconds is your creation. You're never going to create that what you just did ever again. So you got to let it go. And in diving, I had 11 dives on three meter springboard. So in prelims and finals, 11 dives, prelims, 11 dives, finals. That's 22. Men's platform, 10 dives. Prelims, 10 dives. Finals, 10 dives. That's another 20. So that's 42 opportunities to practice peak performance in one competition, in a major competition. And we had numerous competitions year after year. So, and I understood that each creation is a new creation. I was trying to put those those top creations together mm. into one. Wow. Hey there, Golden Ones. Are you tired of settling for clothes that lack soul, style, and purpose? Well, we've got something for you with One Golden Thread. It's time to upgrade your wardrobe with One Golden Thread, the brand that's redefining fashion and making a positive impact on the planet. I'm Jeff Skult founder and designer. With One Golden Thread, you're not just buying clothes, you're planting seeds of change. Every purchase contributes to planting a tree, helping to restore our precious environment and create a brighter future for generations to come. And don't take my word for it. Read the reviews. The clothing isn't just stylish, it's versatile and inclusive. Whether you're hitting the gym, meeting friends for coffee, or chilling at home, one Golden Thread's designs effortlessly blend comfort, functionality, and sophistication. But what truly sets us apart is our golden ethos. A commitment to living life to the fullest while embracing regenerosity and connection with the world around us. So why settle for ordinary when you can elevate your style and make a difference? Visit OneGoldenThread.com today and join the movement towards a more conscious and golden way of living. One golden thread, <laughs> because life's too short for anything less. And hey, because why not? Here's a first time checkout love code from me, deeper than anything you will find elsewhere. Drops of gold. Find your sexy and soulful golden thread self at One Golden Thread. Drops of gold is your go-to code. Guaranteed you will like it. Try it, buy it, love it. And if you don't, just return it. No questions asked. You are golden. We are all connected as one golden thread. Let's go deeper into the dive of the flow state within the chaos. Yeah. Because that's extraordinary and has such a powerful metaphor mm. for life. So take us up on the board again and take us into the 3.5 and the chaos and how do you block out the noise and, and, and even the fear. You know, oh. a chapter a chapter of um drop of gold is gonna be revere fear, there's gold in there. Mm -hmm. And clearly for you there was. And so I'd love to have you okay. share with our listeners that. Okay. I'll, I'm going to share with you my final dive, com, my final competitive dive. So this was Seoul, Korea, 1988. As I, okay, when you are going through the rounds, I, cl I climb up to the, 
platform. So I'm in between the 10 meter platform and seven and a half meter platform. So I'm out of sight, out of respect for Shun Ni, for the next diver, for the diver who's diving. So I'm just out of sight, just out of respect. Mm -hmm. They announced. Is that a standard protocol, or does that, or, yeah. or was that your protocol? It's it's standard protocol. Okay. But sometimes, sometimes other athletes are more comfortable if they have another diver up top. Got it. You know, that's because then it feels a little bit more like practice, and so they it allows them to relax a little bit more. Okay. And so they'll want somebody up there with them because then they don't feel so alone. Um. But anyways, so I was standing, you know, just between the seven and a half meter and 10 meter platform, just out of sight. And uh, they announced Shun Ni, um, China, uh, People's Republic of China, inward three and a half, 3.1, I think. And I saw this flash of flesh. And then I heard this rip you know, this, you know going into the, into the water you have a rip entry and it sounds like somebody's tearing sheets heard this rip entry and then the crowd erupted i mean you could feel the vibration you could feel that energy and it was and they were stomping their feet yelling screaming clapping and i had to remind myself that they're cheering for him and not against me. Mm. Because we always take things so personally, especially in, in situations of vulnerability. And so I had to remind myself there's a cheering for him and not against me. And then um, I remember thinking, no matter what happens, my mother's still gonna love me. Because that's where I would always go. That was my, my release valve, my pressure release valve. Um, and so then I got this vision of my mother sitting at home because she wasn't in Seoul. My parents weren't in Seoul. Sitting at home, watching it on TV, and I do this bomb of a dive. The splash goes all the way up to the 10 meter when we're not supposed to make a splash. And my mother sitting at home, bouncing up and down on the couch. She, oh, wasn't that a pretty splash? You know, and it just made me <coughs> laugh. I just laughed. And then... You know, I, I, I knew everything would be okay, no matter what happened. But, I mean, I wasn't going to give up without a fight. And um, the one thing that came to mind was, you know, in preparation, it was a reverse three and a half somersault. So we were talking about a swing word, a golf swing word. You know, that one word that kind of encompasses something, your interpretation of what success looks like, basically. And that was mellow, because my coach, Ron O'Brien, would say, mellow, you know, like to relax, you know, and so, and that meant to me, relax in my shoulders and swing, so I can swing my arms through. You know, and that was my reverse three and a half. Because if I did that, everything else would fall into place. And I did that dive. I knew it was a good dive. I didn't know how good. And I came up out of the, out of the water, grabbed my chamois, and I just threw it over my face. I didn't want to look at the scoreboard. I was afraid to. And then the way that I knew that I won was I looked over at my coach, Ron O'Brien, and his son jumped over the barrier. And he, he and his father were jumping up and down in celebration. That's how I knew I won. And then I just lost it. I just lost it. Because I knew those were my last competitive dives. I didn't share it, that with anybody at the time because I didn't want it to be superstitious. I, didn't, I, you know, I just didn't want to have that other pressure kind of on my shoulders. But I knew that those were my last competitive dives because I was diagnosed HIV positive. At that time, they told you to get your affairs in order. You know, you have two years to live. And so I didn't think I'd see 30. So that's how I was maneuvering through my life. 
is I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. So I wasn't really living. Mm. You know, finally starting to live and embrace it instead of running from it. Mm. It's kind of scary. <laughs> Speaking of scary, um, let's stay on the let's stay on the um, on the board. And there was an extraordinary, visceral, and very visual for us all to be part of of your hero's journey when something happened. When I hit my head, mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I remember it. it I, I remember being in the living room with my father and watching it, and it just—it was so. We didn't know. Yeah. We didn't know, and and I'd love to, if you feel comfortable, and uh, to share a, a little bit about the moment from what happened and. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Yeah, I mean, it was my, fortunately it was prelims, uh, prelims of the men's three meter springboard. And on my ninth dive, I knew I was gonna be close. And uh, so I came out with my hands very close to my body because it's usually your hands or your arm that hits the board. Got it. And I thought I was well past the board coming out of the dive. And then I heard this big hollow thud. And I go crashing in the water. I was thinking, what the hell was that? I was like, shit, that was my head. My first emotion was I was embarrassed. I was supposed to be a good diver and good divers don't do that kind of shit, right? And I was trying to figure out how can I get out of the pool without anybody seeing me? And then, you know, because all the cameras are pointing down, crowds there. Yeah, and so I just grabbed my head and I just, you know, got out of the pool. Um, I remember, I think it was Jan Grunde Vegard. Um, uh, it's a uh, Norwegian coach, dive coach, big guy. You know, he came over to me and starts, you know, scraping through my hair, you know, to see if you know, he, could, he could see the cut. And I was like pushing him away because I didn't want him you know touching me um, because I was HIV positive and so I didn't that was my fear and so I, um, I I really didn't know what my responsibility would was and also when you get an injury like that it doesn't bleed right right away so the whole blood in the pool that's a media thing that's a you know it's 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 drama you know, but an injury like that doesn't bleed right away, especially, you know, when you are in the midst of competition because mm -hmm. everything's constricted, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to bleed right away. So I just held my head, started walking around the pool to meet my coach. And then my coach uh, uh, kind of got the doctor and we were moving towards, we were walking past the, the Chinese team. And then by that time, there was a little trickle of blood that was going down my hairline. And my coach, Ron O'Brien, pushed it back up in, into my hairline because he didn't want them to know that I bled red. <laughs> they want, he wanted them to truly believe that I just, you know, I, I had ice in my veins or whatever. But um, yeah, so... We got into the room and Dr. James Puffer and Dr. Ben Rubin, um, Ron said, look, you've got a decision to make. You know, you, I will support you 100%. If you want to walk away, you don't have to get back out, of, out there. This is your choice. And I said, I only got, I, I, I didn't get many scores on that. I saw zeros up there. I can't be in the running. And he sent somebody out of the room and, you know, to find out where I was. And they came back and they said, you're in fifth place. I was in fifth place. I could do my last two dives 
and still make the finals. And then in finals, everything goes away. You start from zero. I was like, oh, okay. And I, I said, you know what, we've worked too long and hard to get here and I don't want to give up without a fight. And I'm not a fighter. I'm not even competitive. I'm a performer and I'm pretty passive. So who came to mind was um, my buddy Ryan White, who was the young boy who contracted HIV through his clotting factor, who's a hemophiliac. And he was a fighter because he fought for the right to education for kids in his same predicament. And so he was my inspiration because I knew he would fight. And so then, um, you know, my coach told Dr. Rubin and Dr. Puffer, you know, to sew my head up. And then he said, let's go for a walk. I said, okay. So I followed him. And he said, you know, I got five stitches in my head. He said, hockey players, they get 30 stitches and get back on the ice. You got five stitches in your head. It's nothing. You'll, you'll, you know, it's, it's nothing. Um, it's like, okay. You know, and we were both laughing, you know, just, you know, going back and forth. And then, um, and then he said, you don't have time to get over this. So you need to set it aside like it never happened. It was just a fluke. And that's what, it was just a fluke. So do your last two dives just like you've been doing in practice and you'll be fine. And I said, by the way, there was another, there was another pool. I said, jump in the pool because I still had blood by that time in my bathing suit and I was wearing a white bathing suit. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, I better get rid of that before I climb up on the board. That wouldn't be cool. And then, you know, they announced my dive. I was going in, my last two dives were going in the same direction, reverse. So I was doing a reverse one and a half with three and a half twists. And so they said, Greg Luganis, United States of America, reverse one and a half with three and a half twists, 3.4 degree of difficulty. And, you know, I set the board and I heard an audible gasp from the audience because it was going in the same direction. And then I took a deep breath and I patted my chest because I felt like my heart was beat pounding outside my chest. And um, the people who were in the vicinity who saw that said, oh, they started laughing. They started giggling. It was like, oh my God, he's scared. We're scared for him. You know, it was this the whole energy exchange of, oh my God, he's scared. You, you, yeah. You know, and so I you know, indicated that, yes, I was scared because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't have time to get over this. I had to like, just like it never happened. And so I, that made me start laughing. And then I was thinking, okay, reverse one and a half, three and a half twists. You know, just do it just, do it just like you've been doing in practice. I said, but this is the Olympic Games. I can't hold back. So I did that dive. Turned out to be the highest scoring dive of that Olympics. <laughs> I was like, crazy. And that's the reason why, I mean, you know, when I say that uh, many of my performances came through me, they weren't me. You know what I mean? It's inspired. It's not, and it's... I'm just used as, as, as a tool of, ex of expression. Because you can't make that shit up, right? No, you can't make that shit up. You know? You know there's, there, Where the hell did that come from? Well, there are those that perform, and there are those that prayer form. Mm. You were a prayer former in everything that you've done. It was, it, was, it was channeled light, which is the irony of all ironies, that your mother told you to dim your light. We'll get back to that I'm sure. <laughs> again and again and again. But, but let, let's yeah. let, take us through. Okay, so top score or, 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 yeah. or best score of the competition. The crowd's going ape shit. Yeah. Your heart was beating so hard. You come out of the pool, and then what happens? 
Well, that was the prelims. Yeah. I mean, I had to come back the next day and perform all of those dives all over again, even the dive that I hit my head on the board. And so, you know, the, um, when, I, when I was walking... When, when, uh, so when we finished the prelims, then we were walking to the bus, and um, the team handball team were like my bodyguards <laughs> to make sure that I got on the bus safely and all that stuff. But you know, because everybody wanted to talk to me, and um, I love that it's not the sumo wrestlers. I love that it's the, the handball team. That's all. Yeah, team handball. <laughs> team yeah. handball. These are the good. Yeah, they're the, they're yeah. the best with the TV. Men animals. and women. Got it. Men and women's I mean, team team handball. They okay. were like surrounding me. It's like, okay, don't fuck with us. You know? Here for the handball. Yeah. And and um, and it was so funny because like this one reporter said, Greg, what happened? I said, I hit my head on the board. She said, how'd that happen? I guess I was too close. And we both started look, look, looked at each other, started laughing. It was like, oh my God. I mean, how freaking obvious and you know but but then they got me to the olympic village um and then i went to the medic and they you know shaved it and redid the stitches and all that stuff and it was a sleepless night you know because i kept bumping my head into the headboard you know hard for me to try you know because i'm trying to process but it's really not happening um, so then I show up to the pool the next day and fortunately our finals were in the morning because they were in Seoul, you know, different time zone and all that to, uh, adjust to the, uh, broadcasting in the U S. Um, and so our, our finals were in the morning, fortunately. So, uh, I didn't get much sleep and my coach I I did far more dives than I ever have done before a finals uh, because I did all of my dives in order and then I got to my ninth dive, reverse two and a half pike. And I did probably about six or seven until I, um, he said, fine, jump the first one out. And then we start bringing it back in, bringing it back in, bringing it back in. I said, okay. Um, so I didn't know what was going to happen. And actually it was interesting because <clears throat> one of the other coaches, years later, one of the other coaches, Scott Rich, he uh, reminded me why that probably happened yeah. is we had a dive camp in Hawaii, Honolulu, um, at the university there. And the board that I was using was a little slick, you know, didn't have as much um, grip uh, as it no normally would. Uh, it may have been an older board. And it sloped a little bit downhill. So my weight had to be a little bit further back in order to be in good distance. Mm. And I said, you know, he, and we practice there. So we get good at what we practice. And that was, that was what he surmised happened yeah. and the reason why it happened. And it makes sense. It makes sense. Wow. Wow. And so what happened that day at the, after, the day after the prelims? Did, well, I mean, the, once the competition started, um, I mean, like I said, I did more dives than I nor normally do before a finals because usually at that, you know, you just want your body warmed up. Yeah. Um, but I was still dealing with some head issues, <laughs> you know, that, uh, you know, the psyche, you know, of having the confidence. And then once we started the competition, I just got stronger and stronger and stronger yeah. and more and more confident. So by the time that that series of dives came up, then I was fine. Wow. It's interesting that you made the statement that you're not competitive, nor are you a fighter. And what came through for me was something when you invoked 
Ryan, uh, Ryan's name. Ryan White. Ryan White. And, you know, what, what came through was something that's so noble. And, and it's what happens when we stand for others by standing for ourselves. Mm. Is what I'm feeling in that moment was that you were a fierce warrior. And as Victor has reminded me before, like warriors only fight to keep the peace. Mm. Or what, what warriors defend the peace. Right. And that, there's, when I started this year, um, the, the mantra that came through my mind, it was revere and protect the realm and wield the shield. Revere and protect the realm, which is our integrity, the character mm. of what we're doing, and wield the shield with power and veracity. Mm. And, you know, I think that it's, it, it's you, when you take a stand, you do it with such fierceness that it's like foxhole mentality. You don't need to be a fighter. You don't need to be competitive. It's it's a horse of a of a very regal color. Yeah, I mean it's like a it's a very golden horse, right? Yeah. So I I just want to I just want to honor that because um, you know I think it our listeners would be surprised to hear that somebody who's swept the gold medal of the games in 84 and 88 and you know and, and it's standing the test of time never been done before in yeah. terms of diving and what have you and and um so it's it's a it's a very po- it's a very powerful thing to to realize that we don't need to be a fighter to be mm. to be highly precisely accomplished we can yeah. and, and that and i think it comes back to this notion of flow yeah yeah and you know it it it's interesting because, of course, everybody remembers 84 and 88. Yeah. Um, a lot of people forget. I was in the 1976 Olympic Games. And then two years after that, I was world champion. Right. From 78 to 88, I dominated my sport. You know, with five Olympic medals, one silver, two, four gold five world championship titles, yeah. six Pan American championship titles, titles meaning I won, 47 national, 47 national titles. If you count other, in the US, if you count other nationals that I participated in, I think I was national champion in, in Japan, they let me compete there, and then also in Australia, so it was over 50 national titles please help please help us frame how michael jordan like this is in term, i mean is this these are these are these are accomplishments that may stand the test of time for the test of time yeah the way that the <laughs> the diving schedule is structured now it'd be almost because they added synchronized diving yeah it would almost be impossible yeah. for those records to be broken. Speaking of Michael Jordan, was he in the? Was he playing with? The, was that the Dream Team year? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Well, it was. Yeah. So, one of the that things that I'd, I'd love to. Wow, I'd love to actually. You were such a beacon for that Olympics. Were there moments of engagement with other Olympians who were inspired by hmm. uh, that you had a chance to interact with? What was the village like? Did you have a chance to did did, did, did those were there, who walked up to you and said, "Wow, are you okay? You inspired me, and I'm excited to get on my version of the court." Or the pool. Excuse yeah. Me. yeah. I, you know what? I don't know. I, um, okay. Uh, do you remember the decathlete Jorgen Henson? Yeah. Okay. So I thought he was ho- so hot. <laughs> I had such a crush. <laughs> I saw him at lunch. It was like, oh, I got to go say hi. You know? And I was like, hi. You know? And, and we had lunch. I mean, it was like so sweet. And he's the sweetest man. Yeah. You know, and his family, he's, I think his mother's in Santa Barbara and all that. But just the kindest guy. Um, 
And, you know, it doesn't matter what sport. It doesn't... Yeah. I mean, and it also doesn't matter if it's what it is. You know, it can be dance. It could be, yeah. you know, music. It could be theater. It could be, you know, any number of things. Peak performance or flow is, mm. it's all the same. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, um, I'd love to actually hear who inspires you from a peak performance and flow perspective in, in, in the world. Like, a, like if you were to put together a, a supper and then sitting around yeah. that circle was, uh, was, was, it was a hero's table for you. Who would, who would be at that table? Well, um, now it, it would be different, but before, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's all the people that they'd make comparisons. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, um, uh, uh, oh, who was the ballet dancer? Not Barishnikov. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking Nureyev for some reason, but Nureyev or Barishnikov. <laughs> but Barishnikov is the one who came up. And um, I'd love to, you know, tap into that because I think that all of our experiences at various times, you know, because uh, there was a span of time. Yeah. And it changes. It has to. Yeah. It's constant change, constant change, constant change. So I'd love to see that trajectory and how it kind of played out. Um, you know, a, along those lines, along more of the spiritual lines, you know, I'd like to, you know, sit down like with a Michael Singer. Yes. I'd like to, um, you know, I'm looking forward to spending more time with, with Kyle Cease yes. you know, in his journey. Um, really excited about his event. I think it's June, June, June 20th through the 23rd. I think, um, but in Glendale. So I'm really excited about that uh, because I just kind of happened on to Aaron Apke, mm. who in his teachings and, and what he's you know talking about, I'm just fascinated. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. But, um, and, you know, it's, it really is all connected. Yeah. You know, I don't realize, you know, we try to compartmentalize and put things in buckets and they, it's all, a thing. it's all one thing. Well, you got two more seats at the table, the spiritful table. Yeah. So who's, who else, who are two others at the spirit table? Um, I, I, I had always wanted to like hang out with, uh, with Dr. Wayne Dyer. Yeah. You know, I just want to go to Hawaii and I'm, I learned by observing, you know, and so I had, a lot of times I have difficulty reading and, you know, being dyslexic. So, yeah. um, it's like, uh, I, I learned by example yeah. you know, and I, and that means that has much more meaning to me. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes of all time was the Wayne Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky quote. Yeah. When he was asked why he was such a great hockey player because he wasn't the biggest he wasn't the strongest he certainly wasn't right. the fastest and he said do you remember it no he said because i don't skate where the puck is i skate to where the puck's gonna be oh yeah okay no that totally makes sense mm -hmm. yeah and i mean and it totally makes sense and it's so obvious the the the, the great shit is so Freaking easy. Yes. You know, yeah. it's like, we, it, oh, it could be, that's too easy. Yeah. That's a blinding glimpse of the obvious. And yeah. it's so potent when you can say like, ah, like I'm not going to get stuck in the story of the now where that thing is. I'm actually going to allow myself to see what can become and therefore that's going to be right. where I'm naturally flow stating to. Right. Because it's always moving. Well, I even I, I loved your um, the expression around you know the gift that you gave yourself around mellow, like relax and oh, that yeah, was a, yeah. that was flow state. Yeah, um, and that's just one dive. Hmm? That's allowing. What? 
allowance. Allowance. Yeah. 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 You're allowing. Yeah. I mean, be- Yeah. Mm-hmm. Victor is saying, like when it, when you're in flow state, it's just you. It's you yourself and God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And this this notion around allowing. I mean, one of the gifts we can give ourselves is to allow ourselves to receive with ease. Mm-hmm. Allow ourselves to receive with ease. Allow ourselves to receive with ease. I mean, literally, mm-hmm. like if there's a mantra that we can we can all just gift ourselves is just allow, receive, ease. Mm-hmm. You brought up something that's so fucking cool, and I want to make sure that it gets the it gets the the, the elevated shine that it's intended. If there was a third person sitting here, which was the um, well, by when this episode is released, it will it will be a previous episode of Drops, Drops of Gold. Um, if there was a third chair here, Peter Crone is sitting with us, and Peter Crone is the mind architect. Peter Crone's worked with some of the top performing athletes um, mm-hmm. and celebrities and actors uh, of how they release the blocks of their mind, and he's worked mm-hmm. with with home run hitters that can no longer hit home runs. He's worked with pitchers that couldn't get the ball over the plate. He's worked with actors who no longer get... And and what he spoke to Mm -hmm. is what you spoke to. And it's so fucking cool that what you do is you stand up on that board and before you dive, you visualize making a cannonball splash equivalency and oh, your mother, yeah, yeah. my mother's still gonna love st- me. Yeah, st- still loving you yeah. and cheering for you about what a beautiful splash yeah. you made. Because Peter talked about the way that he gets them over is is, is the home run hitter to say, um, "I want you to close your eyes and I want you to visualize fucking up, fucking up." <laughs> I want you to visualize <laughs> right, and uh, you're you you're never gonna hit another home run, right. and you are not gonna be able to get the ball over the plate. Yeah. As a pitcher, and 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 the, and within that visualization, are you going to be less loved? Mm. Are you going to be shamed? Right. Are you going to be seen as less than? And it's this whole notion of the joyfulness of the yes and. Yeah. Like I'm here for the yes and and this notion. I mean, I love the and, and by the way, is there a b- more beautiful visual than like a kid doing a cannonball? And it's like the mommy, but what a beautiful yeah, splash. splash! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to just honor you, and also just and 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 really just presence that because that is such a beautiful, powerful, and those can go back to the episode of Peter Crone and actually he he dives into this notion of like going God, deep awesome. into the going deep into the. The failure, which is a wink, wink, nudge, nudge from the universe, like no, not yeah. really. Uh, yeah. That was that was a story right. that we told ourselves. Yeah, we shouldn't have done those dives. We shouldn't have done this. I mean, the truth of the matter is that should creates resistance, and should is just you know should is just a messy mess all over ourselves. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We keep shitting all over ourselves. You know. Yeah. It's like why are you shitting all over yourself? Yeah. Don't shit like, all yeah, over yeah, yourselves. Yeah. yeah. Don't shit all over yourselves. Yeah. 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 No more shitting. <laughs> you shall. Yeah. Or we get to. Yeah. Or we already did. It's invoked. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's like, you, the, sooner you, the sooner you take that out of your vocabulary, you know, the better off you're going to be. Because, no, it. what happened? I mean, what, you're going to fight against what happened? You're going to fight against reality? You're just like, yeah. should, it is. It was. It, well, you know, we, we've all done our, various dalliances with our personal journey exercises and you know i'll go ahead and i'll just out myself i did i went to landmark i did do landmark and you know i i had my moments of of like not positive boundaries around this and that and I mean, there was an aspect of it that i really genuinely believe that the universe um, will be well served to receive and it's this notion around three draws three circles in your mind over here on the left hand side is something happened over here on the right hand side above it on the right hand side is is we create a story mm-hmm. around that story. and then below that we another circle um you can put the words we create meaning around meaning it. right and you know we're all storytellers mm-hmm. great 
Um, or, or we're, and then we become, we're meaning making machines, particularly in the human condition of the, mm. of the scarcity and the what have you. And so something happened, we create a story like your mother, you know, look, something happened. Mm -hmm. Your mother told you not to outshine your sister. Right. We create a story around that, yep. which is like, mm, I better not shine my light too bright. Mm -hmm. um, and then the meaning is like, if I do, then I'm being selfish, narcissistic, or egoic, or at least that's what I discovered yeah. in my life. And so I replayed that story as if it continued to happen and happen and happen and happen and happen. Mm -hmm. So that was a powerful, beautiful thing to unpack those things and say like, mm, actually, something happened. That doesn't go away, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna, go allow, I'm gonna give myself, again, allowance, Mm -hmm. to obliterate that top right circle of creating story around it. No, right. there's no story. And then well, um, and then with there's no story, we can't create meaning. And it's just like something that happened and we no longer play that in our minds. And that is, is it is it easier said than done? I don't know. I mean, sure, but, and, 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 I, and it's an and. Yeah, I, I'm going to say this. It's easier to take a step sideways and mm -hmm. view the story differently yeah. Because then you can devise the meaning, a new meaning to the story. You don't have to get rid of the story. You're not denying anything. You're okay. not denying a story. So You're just seeing it from a different perspective. So then let's go there. Um, something happened. Your mother told you. Not to outshine your sister. sister. What is the sidestep new story that you're telling yourself? <sighs> you know, it, it it's hard because you know my mother was such I, I I see as such a great inspiration, you know, and I think that you know she was doing the best that she could with the information that she had, yeah, um, and also uh, I think from her perspective she was trying to protect my sister yeah. and offer my sister love. Um, possibly I was taking that too personally mm. and that, you know, the interpretation of that, my interpretation of that was, oh, I, you know, I, I, I got it dull my light. Um, but the focus wasn't me. Yes the focus wasn't intended to be me. The focus was my sister. So take that out of the, the equation, then it has a totally different meaning. Mm. She was saying, I love my daughter. She wasn't saying that she didn't love me. She wasn't saying that. And that's what I feel I'm embracing mm -hmm. and it's something you know but it's something that we practice yeah. so for such a long time we really have to pay attention when that's coming up oh oh there that is yeah. there that that dimming my oh I'm dimming my light again oh there I go again and the thing that I love you know because um talked about Kyle Cease. I love what he says. You know, whatever's going on, I'm dimming my light again, and I love that. I'm doing that, and I love that. Because then you're giving it love for it to allow it to dissolve. Yeah. yeah. Because if you hang on to it, any trace of that, you can't hang on to it with love. It's incongruent. It just will go away, dissolve. And that's what I learned. I mean, that I'm, I'm learning to, when those things come up yes. in my body, because we feel it in our body, our bodies will tell us the truth. Our minds will lie to us. Yes. So when we listen to our bodies, it's like, ooh, okay, I, I recognize that. And just sit in it because we need to dissolve it. Mm. You know, and it's what Michael Singer talks about addiction. It's like, it's going to be painful, 
But if you sit with it, give it ease, a breath, sit with it. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, I recognize that. It's like, okay, it'll pass. Mm. I mean, that's how we dissolve all those blockages and things that might be tripping us up. Yes. That we may not be conscious of. And that's, for me, that's what I'm learning you know, to practice. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's continuing to evolve. It's continuing to evolve. And again, this notion around like, it may not be easy and yet we can allow ourselves to receive with ease. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's that right? to me. Otherwise, this is all supposed to be joyful. Like we get to be like, we were, we had a beautiful, episode um recently with madame gandhi and she talked about that her her soul journey is to optimize her joy yeah ah so good yeah so good and and what a potent thing because within joy we can it, joy is also the discovery and the learning and the letting and the receiving and the lifting and the gifting and being there standing with others for others and being there for yourself with that fierceness that is is fun yeah and that's what i see in you and it's been an honor to to witness you and um you, know, you talk about um i mean this is fresh we met a year ago i feel like i've known you for lifetimes and this is freshy fresh like yeah. a year yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to re re rewind the circumstances with which we met. Um, and I would just also like just to acknowledge and compliment that you, you showed up looking great today. <laughs> <laughs> I know, all in one golden thread, right? The only thing that's not one golden thread <laughs> is my socks. So, yeah. Um, you know, we, we talk about thoughts, words, and actions. Mm -hmm. Like, what are the thoughts we're thinking? What is the food we're eating? Um, and for so many of us, including myself, you know, the forgotten frontier was what are the clothes we're wearing. Mm. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear for you what your experience has, has been because you didn't show up in these clothes because outside of any other reason that you chose to show up in these clothes as I witnessed you on social media choosing choosing these threads like what is it about um the expression the feeling of the feeling i'd love to in your own words because it's uh yeah, yeah it's it's i created this everything for, for me first and and yeah. then for others who are choosing yeah. to choose the thing that's uh and, and this is actually this is a part of the because i started working for la 28 oh yeah let's talk um, about that as well uh but what with regard to the clothing not only I, I, I love the style. I love it. Feels like a big hug, like I, you know, like I said before. Um, I love that, um, and uh, but I, I love the sustainability aspect of it, of the giving back, and that's what I want to feel and embrace and yeah. reflect. Hmm. You know, because we're not always reflecting. A lot of times we're not reflecting what, who we truly are. Um, you know, I, I started working for LA 28 um, because this whole fellowship kind of came across my site. My manager brought it to my attention. It's like, oh my God, that'd be awesome. Because what, ha what happened was I had this experience over the summer. I was in Estonia speaking at Vishen Lakhiani's Mind Valley University, and I was one of the presenters, very mindful about the carbon footprint. The vendors who were involved, you spend an extra euro for the container, and then you put it, you get it in the right bin, then you're credited that euro back. Um, no plastic water bottles. You had your, you know, your, your water bottle and spigots to, to fill it. Um, it was very mindful. And then a couple of weeks later, I went to Fuoka, Japan, the World Championships, World Aquatic Championships. And I saw for the volunteers the single use plastic bento boxes and all these plastic water bottles for the athletes. And 
I was just like, oh my God, you know, this is a world champ. There's world events happening all the time. Sporting events, music events, all of these, you know, events with, you know, catering to thousands, oftentimes people. And we really need to be, I feel, more mindful in how we do things. So um, I was, when the president of the aquatics, uh, World Aquatics F Federation asked me, I said, well, what do you think of the world championships? And I said, well, a lot of plastic. And, and then the attorney chimed in and said, you know, well, we got to keep the, the water safe, safe resource for the athletes because somebody could spike it, you know, to sabotage them. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it's like, you know, it was kind of crazy. But when the fellowship came up, I was thinking, I want to, you know, make sure those questions are asked about sustainability. I mean, I understand bottom line, you know, but if something is priced priced out um, because there is a bottom line, the more people know about the people who are doing better, they might get more support where they can pull their prices down and be more, much more competitive. So yeah. the more actively we get involved with this whole issue, the better for, ev for everyone, you know, to go away from the, uh, you know, major corporations. And, you know, and, you know I, I mean, I even sometimes look, you know, because Coca-Cola is one of the sponsors and like, oh, Okay, um, yeah, but just getting the message out there and being aware, asking the questions, yeah. you know, can we do better? Can we do better? You know? Uh, it was, the can we do better is, you know, one of the inquiries that I followed the thread to, mm -hmm. to, birth right. one golden thread exactly and it started with me doing better yeah. and it didn't well, start with just clothing it started actually with can we do better in terms of being expressed well that's and, where we have to start with ourselves that's the only thing we have yeah. control over and yeah and you know it's it's it, it, I, I remember going to the global sustainability conference and at the un or in the, then the un and i'm watching all these people show up and like denim and polyester and i'm really thinking to myself wow i mean it's, is this, am I missing something mm. or are we all missing something? Yeah. Um, and that's why I speak to, you know, clothing is the forgotten frontier no longer. And we don't have to fall prey to just being mired and being problemist or talking about the plight. We can actually um, talk about the passion and the purpose of just, you know, the deliciousness of consciousness. Like it can all be. Right. Fun. That's why, yeah. you know, I typically don't spend a tremendous amount of time talking about, you know, the 80 billion articles of clothing made every year and the 87% will wind up in an incinerator landfill within 18 months and that less than 3% are sustainable fibers, which means that all that is just plasticizing the planet and toxifying the, so the soil and, and then leaching into the oceans with 38% of the microplastics that are in the ocean. And, and for most of us, you know, it's just like, wow, that's so big mm -hmm. and it's just so perverse that I'm just going to hide from it and I can't do anything about it. Yep. But the reality is, is like we can, because we can simply, you know, like I've just shared this story and I'll share this story as many times as people choose until everybody really says like, oh, I, I remember that story and I can apply that to my own life. But one of the great lessons I learned was from my dog, Sam when I was in second grade and my dad and Sam was sick. He had worms and we had to give him a pill mm. and, you know, giving a dog a pill is, can be a challenging thing to do. And so my dad never mentioning it, missing a teaching moment says, Jeff, how do we give Sam the pill? And I'm like, Oh my God, my dad's asking me my opinion. This is like a big moment for me. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we'll hide it in his food. And my dad says, no, no, that, 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 you know, he'll, he'll sniff it, feel it, spit it out. And if you want to give a dog a pill, you wrap it in something sweet. 
So we wrapped it in peanut butter. Not quite as good as Harry's little yeah. little ad for Harry's honey peanut butter. Best peanut butter on the planet, by the way. Yeah. Farmer's Market. Yeah. Shout out. Um, uh, you know, you when you're wrapping in something sweet, we be, we stop we cease being problemists and now we become solutionists mm-hmm. and it just becomes sweet. And so the moment that I just focus on just making a delicious product that allows people to look and feel as good as they are Mm -hmm. and to have a beautiful reminder that you can also give back while you're actually wearing and that every item plants a tree and we're unpolluting a polluting industry and you know it's made in love shops versus sweatshops uh, you know in some you know far off foreign country you know we can can do that and mm-hmm. and it, it 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 really comes back into this notion of like what does it mean for us all to be resourced resourced like we're, we're going back to the source we're going back to reminding ourselves that the greatest lie is the illusion of separation mm-hmm. not between just us but between us and nature and that we can be tighter to our own nature when we're reminded that we are nature mm-hmm. and you know i think the last point i'll just make on that is <clears throat> I've had a lot of moments in my life where I had like senses of a, a loneliness, not necessarily loneliness always, but a loneliness and like, well, what does it all mean? How does it all tie together? But that, that, that reminder and that actually occurred for me on some uh, plant medicine moment mm-hmm. is like, Oh no, we actually are nature. Yep. And, yeah. and that's yeah. where a lot of this coherence comes from in terms of the clothing is I think this is mm-hmm. deliciously richly connected and it's uh, and it's an effortless way to um, remind ourselves that the four million receptors on our skin are the fastest way for us to come back into that feeling. Yeah. Sound of music, a spoonful of sugar, <laughs> makes the medicine go down. <laughs> <laughs> was that that was a song, right? Yeah, yeah. Can a spoonful can... of sugar makes the medicine go down. It really helps the medicine go down, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, it was, it was fun. Um, what else would you care to share that, that that we haven't covered? That maybe there's been some some touches and dalliances uh, as we wind down this beautiful first of. You know, <laughs> love to have you back for another another yeah. in the future. But what what, yeah. what would you what would you like to what would you like to take this? Mm. I think what I'm grace, mm. you know, that giving ourselves grace and giving others grace. Um, I mean, that's what I'm learning. I, you know, cause like I see people and I see people, I said, Oh, that's where I want to be, but I'm not yet. And that's okay. And then I see other people, friends like, you know what? It's not fitting anymore. Like it used to. And so letting go, Hmm. you know, I think that giving ourselves the grace to acknowledge that, you know, some things, you know, they worked for a time and it may not work anymore. So it's okay to let it go. And then it, you may see something that you're attracted to, that you're pulled to, drawn to. Um, and I feel that I'm finding that, you know, with, um, I mean, our friends are a reflection of ourselves and where we're at. So it really is, uh, for me, I'm recognizing, you know, um, there's some things I need to let go of and to give myself the grace and permission to let go of it that it's okay, it served its purpose. Um, which allows me to, uh, to lean into the attraction of where I wanna, where I wanna be, where I wanna go. And it's not a destination, that's just it. You know, it's, it is a process, it's a journey. Um, I think it was, Dr. Wayne Dyer said that, you know, there, it, life is like a train, you know, some are in it for one stop 
and it's temporary. Some people are on for a long haul. Some people get off. Some people get back on. Some, you know, it's different. But allowing that grace that and that you're not um, trying to control or manip manipulate. And and also being true to your being honest, mm. you know. Sometimes it's hard to be honest with ourselves because of the stories we make up, right? You know, everything. It's it's not about the story. It's about the meaning we give that story. Because we can always change the story. It's just a thought. But like I said, if we change perspective, then the story changes. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the story that you're writing, from where you're igniting, the, where you're going. What's the, you're in this, oh. uh, you're in this beautiful, open, expansive, playful, <laughs> uh, connected, chapter of your life where you're you're I think you're, I'm still discovering though mm -hmm. you know because um, writing the letter to my sister I mean that was ooh you know that was ch challenging um, you know and uncovering a lot but also seeing that that story from a different perspective you know and so I, I think that there's shifts being made yeah um, yeah so direction I'm not quite sure you know what, what's deeply coming into resonance was also something else that Peter shared which was um, a very powerful invocation which was in the absence of all story all that's left is I love you right yeah. and that's what I got from the letter yeah that you share that you wrote yeah you know outside of it all it's just the simplicity of, of just like that yeah um, I designed a piece of jewelry um, it's like there's a diamond in the middle, there's a, a lapis ring, and then a um, uh, white gold ring. Yes. Um, and that design came to me uh, through one of my meditations. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's nothing new. It's not, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's what everybody teaches anyways, but it just, um, came to me in, in, in the design. But when we start meditating, we start with ourselves and we start moving outwards. We go through this veil of judgment, so we label everything. It's good, it's bad, it's light, it's dark, it's this, you know, I'm a son, I'm this, I'm, you know, I'm all of these things. But then we, when we continue our practice, our meditation practice, we work from the outside in. Mm. That blue ring transforms into forgiveness. Once you go through that veil of forgiveness, all that's left at the middle in that diamond is love. That's all it is. That's all, that's all it's all about. That right there might be the golden mic drop. <laughs> so the, our, my co-spirator uh, is invited to share the sound of the golden mic drop and perhaps something else might come through for you for to auditory express that but what's feeling that it could be could be is that beautiful perfect sound of the rip splash is that what it's called the rip splash oh, um, rip entry the rip entry rip entry so it's like a <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> so, so the sound of the golden mic drop. <laughs> Give it to us. <laughs> 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 
Greg Luganus. Yeah. An honor. And wishing you so much grace, space uh, for your beautiful journey and the fact that we get to be sidecar and be dear friends along this journey means so much to me. And thank you for being on Drops of Gold. And and I'm gonna I want to ask one final question because it's um for those that um, have accomplished so much in their life. I think we forget to ask a very important question, which is where can you receive support? Mm. I mean, you can keep up with me um, on social. I'm uh, at Greg Luganus. Um, it's pretty easy to reach out. Um, my website is gregluganus.com. Um, and really, I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of focused. I, I, I started, uh, I thought it was just a pamphlet. Mm. It was uh, direction, uh, making the podium, mm. you know, the Olympic podium. And it's a lot of what we talked about, about peak performance. Um, and it really go, dives into the practices. How do, how do you make that happen? And I'm realizing, yeah, this might be a book. You know, so I'm thinking, because the more that I'm meditating on it, it's like, oh, what about that? Oh, what about that? What about that? Um, and also, people make assumptions. <laughs> people try and tell my story to me. <laughs> I said, oh, you felt this, you, did. you know, just like I was just growing up. And I allowed it. Mm -hmm. I allowed it. I have to take responsibility for that part of it that I had. Mm. So it's like, yeah, I allowed it. You know, so, but now I need to step out, you know, into the light and stand on my own two feet. Yeah. And yeah, and let people know who I am. So the next book could be Making the Podium? So yeah, I don't know if it'd be nice Making title. the Podium. I mean, it's the Breaking the Surface to Making the Podium. Yeah. It seems to be. It, it, the Making the Podium, I, I think, would be more um, kind of instructional. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 that, and that's the other thing. I mean, I, um, don't think that you're going to um, do it I did lightly you know because you have to ask yourself what are you willing to do that no one else in the world will do you have to ask yourself that and push through that what are you willing to do that no one else in the world will do. That's how you break world records. It's not just making the Olympic team. It's not just winning a world championships. And a lot of times, I mean, and I, I ask myself, is it worth it? You know, you're asked a lot, you know, well, was it worth it? Was it worth it? And I can all, honestly say, I don't know. And that's okay. What we can say is that your light is pure gold. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. Sure. What an honor and a pleasure. Thanks. And gold is, is the color of healing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We all have a lot of healing to do. So, yeah. And it feels good. We do. And within that healing, there is also always revealing. Yeah. And that's the yeah. extraordinary part of healing. Yeah. Which is, what are we, what are we allowing ourselves right. to be in this moment? Yeah. And then in this moment, pure gold. Greg Luganis, thank you so much. Thank you.
Anything you wanna? No, that's good. That was the recording was supposed to. Did it stop recording? Okay. No side angles that was amazing. Yeah. Wow, guys. Cool. Wow. Thank you. <sighs> Yay. 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 That was amazing. Yeah. That was amazing. That was great. It's oh. so funny. I never know what's going to come out of my so mouth. It's. I never know there, what's going to come the, out. The, the, I never know what's going to come up. And, and it was so funny because, like, when you were, uh, you know, a spoonful of sugar, it was like, oh, God, I got to remember that. I got to remember that. It was like, oh, yeah, the sound of music. Yes. Okay. It's like, oh, yeah. Did, you ever, soon, did like, you ever play with your singing voice? Yeah, I used to. Uh, yeah, I, I did musicals. Okay, wait, we need to. We, we get. We get to, this is still recording. We get, we, get to, we, get to, we get to hear a song. A, 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 Whatever. What? Whatever you want to sing. Oh no, I don't have anything. No musical? No, not in my no. I, you know, it's so funny because like I I marvel at my friend, my actor friends who can like pull a line. Okay, so what if we were, what, if, what if we were to do karaoke and what if Victory came came and came and joined you and you guys did like okay. a, a shared karaoke? Okay, you guys get the pick. I don't know. You will be found. <gasps> oh my God, that's wild! Oh my God, you no, know, no, it, um, you know, uh, dear Evan Hansen, dear Evan Hansen, you know, um, you know, the person who introduced me to that song, yeah. who brought tears to my eyes every time she sang it, yeah. was Ricky. Oh, Ricky, oh. when she sang that song, it was yeah. it, it was so. When she took me to the musical, yeah. and um, when she would sing that song, yeah. I would cry every time. Yeah. It's such a extraordinarily, yeah. And it's so so interesting because that whole you know the arc of Dear Evan Hansen, you know, who it's, who do you identify as Con- Connor who committed suicide, mm-hmm. and, um, Evan who you know is. Uh, you know, kind of goes down this path, false path, you know, um, and then and then discovery. Word, words fail. That's how. Yeah. Uh, that that was the other one, but you know, you can be on any. You know. I'm not familiar with this. And Ricky's voice with this was so beautiful, so so beautiful. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you you ever ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear me? Well, well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand, you can reach, reach out your hand. And oh, Someone will come running, and I know they'll take you home. Even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need a friend to carry you, and when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. So let the sun come streaming in, cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again. Took your foot and look around You will be found 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 
My speech? People started sharing it, I guess. And now, I mean, Connor is Your everywhere. speech is everywhere. This morning, the Connor Project page, it only had 56 people following. Well, how many does it have now? on the ground you will be found. yeah i love that yeah. song what what yeah what? so connor committed suicide yeah and so um yeah so evan has the hots for his sister and so creates that he had this relationship with connor which he didn't yeah. yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Cat's here to shoot. To, to, you have a treat. I have a treat coming in for you. Yeah, best photographer in the world. Yeah, can I get a cool. can I get a portrait? Yeah, yeah. Um, Hi. Oh yeah, come in, come in, come in. Cat, Greg, if you got. Hi, Cat. Hi. Um, we're just literally in the last in the last few in the last words, and and I just a word about the song because of all the songs you chose. I, I mean that that is such an extraordinary song yeah. about um, back to the light. Yeah. That. Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's been challenging. I mean, because I've been listening, you know, like almost like in a loop, you know. But various stages, you know, I was identifying. Okay, I'm Connor. Oh no, I'm evan no i'm you know and just different different arcs you know mm. of where i'm at you know because um i you know okay so i tried to commit suicide a number of times right i'm not afraid of death i'm not afraid of death um i think it's going to be beautiful yeah um and also suicide to me i don't see it the same way a lot of people, a lot of people see it as selfish and, you know, and, and all. Um, I, when I was 12 years old, I, I, I told my mother, I said, I can understand how somebody can die of sadness and that they could be in so much pain that it, 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 it was much more humane yeah. to release them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I even started a poem of, um, if I s said goodbye, could you let me go? You know, so I've, I teeter on that edge and I always see it as an option. 
Um, but um, I don't think I'm done, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what done looks like. But um, I think there's something else. I think when we, when, when we don't believe that there's anything else, I, that's when I felt like I was getting stuck because yeah. I didn't believe that there was anything else. Yeah. So embracing that, giving myself grace, then getting to the other side. You know. But like I said, I'm not afraid of death. It's okay. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. I mean, I want, shared my, my father's death yeah. you know, and my mother's death, and it was, it was beautiful. I, and we share that. Yeah. I shared my mother's death. I had that honor of holding her chest as she took her last breath, and yeah. it was one of the most extraordinary, yeah. peaceful, loving, joyful moments. And I was just, maybe we could just, you know, um, complete on this thought, uh, which is the fact that you're not afraid of death mm -hmm. and you're not afraid of life. Right. That's an extraordinary through line. Yeah. To living life golden. Yeah. Living life and death golden. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, let's do it together. Oh, oh wait. That one. Okay. Is it ready? Is it, is it, what is it? Choo? Choo. Okay, ready? Yeah. This is the, this is the sound of the golden no, light. No, Oh, this is the sound of the golden mic drop, which is the sound of the, uh, of the rip goal, entry of, of the rip entry, rip entry as a gold medal diver. Uh, diver, obliterating all the records that will stand to the probably in the history of time and sweeping the ninety. This is the sound of what it sounds like to sweep the nineteen eighty four and eighty eight Olympics, and the sound of the golden mic drop, which is. Oh no! Wait! wait. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a. <laughs> Okay. It's almost like a, it's almost like that kid when, 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 as a kid. It's like ka -ka, when you're when you're yeah, karate yeah, yeah, chopping yeah, yeah. somebody. Karate chopping, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Golden Ones. Thank you for being on this episode of Drops of Gold. The special code for you as a reminder is Drops of Gold at checkout for one golden thread. Twenty two percent off gift off purchase your threads. Enjoy your journey. You are golden, and we are all connected as one golden thread. Enjoy your threads. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being with us on Drops of Gold. Produced by Mark Shapiro and Josh Robertson. Music by Josh Robertson and Chazier. I'm your host, Jeff Skult. And remember, in this moment and this moment's forward, remember to always pull on your golden thread and find your truth in this now reality. Thank you for being with us. You are golden. Enjoy your journey.